Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. The last day of term. Uh, it's quite a sacrifice for you to uh, engage in even more academic activity. Uh, but I hope it will be worth your while. Um, as you know, we we're following on, really, from yesterday's lecture, and I think uh, most of you were, were there. But I will say a few words of introduction um, to summarise uh, some of the key issues that uh, arose that may uh, help us um, uh, focus our discussions uh, this afternoon. Uh, better. Um, so the uh, the question, uh, the first question on the on the posters and on the on the blurb on the website was, um, you know, what do we mean when we call the civilization ancient? Um, and I would add perhaps an even more uh, a more concrete version of that uh, that question: uh, Why do we have a discipline called ancient history, um, and what is it supposed to study? I think that's for uh, some of us in this room, anyways, uh, an acute uh, question to have to ask. Of course, traditionally, ancient history is effectively uh, classical history. That is to say, it's the history of the uh, civilizations that produced we regard as the classical works of, of art, uh, of architecture, of literature, of philosophy. Um, and uh, by that uh, definition, um, there's quite a lot of history of the same periods or earlier periods that uh, doesn't register as ancient history because it hasn't produced uh, what uh, we regard as the European classics. Uh, equally, uh, by that uh, definition, the Middle Ages um, can uh, easily be dismissed as the, uh, the stuff that came in between the creation of the classics and the rediscovery of these classics. And so that is a very, uh, a very uh, Eurocentric and uh, modern or Renaissance-inspired uh, perception of what antiquity uh, is. And in a way, the recent developments in the study of, of classics um, have perhaps even reinforced that, and that has been a, a, a quite a significant shift towards the study of reception of classics. And the interest in that is, of course, uh, again, to, to focus very much on what was interesting for the modern world in these products of the ancient uh, world. And so the, the sort of European focus, and of course it's not confined now to, to European reception, but it's a global reception, but at the same time the focus is, if anything, even more on the classical element of these, these great works of the past. Uh, for ancient historians, I think, things have moved in a rather different direction, where, if anything, people have been inclined to, to challenge this idea of the exceptionalism of Greece and Rome, uh, of uh, not denying them their classical status in terms of you know, their, their cultural achievements, but uh, in terms of history, uh, not treating them as um, exceptional to the rest of world uh, history. Um, Ian Morris's lecture yesterday is a really uh, an outstanding, and that some might even say an extreme uh, case of applying this approach, uh, saying ancient history, as we traditionally conceive it, is a very small part of a global ancient history, uh, and we, should, we really need to study this global uh, antiquity in order to uh, understand the world at large, but also that particular bit uh, of it that we traditionally uh, study. Um, so for the few of you who weren't, uh, weren't here, um, were, weren't uh, listening to Ian's lecture yesterday, uh, just to, to recapitulate, um, in, a, in a series of books, and I uh, picked up the, the very last installment, <laughs> the most recent installment, Foragers, Farmers and Fossil Fuels, and with the very intriguing subtitle, How Human Values Evolve, I think that's, uh, even that subtitle is something to chew on <laughs> for now. Um, anyway, a series of books starting and ending for, for the time being with this one, uh, starting with um, uh, uh, Why the West Rules for Now, um, it really tries to do this kind of global analysis. It really writes a, a world history from a particular uh, perspective, and that makes a sort of global comparison possible. Um, the basis for that is the... Uh, Many of you will remember the, the Index of Social Development, also known as the, the Measure of Civilization, uh, second book in the series. Uh, and this quantifies uh, key aspects of, of development, uh, energy capture being one of them, um, information processing being another, urbanization another, and uh, war making capacity the other. These four criteria uh, Ian has measured in some ways so that a comparison in levels of development becomes possible. Um, what's particularly interesting. Um, for ancient historians, in the, in the narrow traditional sense here, I think is the, is the way that, that uh, helps us or, or makes us reconceptualize what we're doing, um, insofar as um, in Ian's model of development over you know, global history, um, the so-called Western core, as opposed to the Eastern core, which is essentially you know, China, 
the Western Tor essentially lies for almost all of this time until about 1400 AD uh, in Egypt and Iraq and not in Greece and in Rome. Um, uh, Greece and Rome are essentially uh, peripheral cultures that um, for a while uh, sort of pestered these but more developed these civilizations eventually take them over and of course that is significant in itself but essentially in terms of development um, what we tend to concentrate on traditionally is pretty much marginal to the real western core of developed uh, culture and society. An uh, interesting implication as well for the Middle Ages, uh, found a very striking formulation so I've written it down, um, in terms of core high developed areas and peripheries, uh, by 700 AD, that is 700 AD, the Islamic world more or less was the western core and Christendom merely a, per merely a periphery along its northern edge. Uh, but even historians might uh, find that a startling uh, formulation, especially in our department where uh, the periphery is very well studied, uh, biblically studied, but the, the core uh, much less so. Um, so this, I, said, uh, I think there's really uh, the material here for a radical rethinking of what we do uh, in ancient history and what we should be doing. And the question does become, is there still anything special about Greece and Rome? Uh, and Ian yesterday uh, suggested that, uh, after all, there was, and it's one of the things we should talk about today. But if I wanted to take his argument, um, uh, perhaps even further than he himself would do, I could say, well, really, the only thing that's still special about antiquity is that the Roman Empire, at its peak, sort of represents a blip on the chart of development when it reaches its, its highest peak before the Industrial Revolution. But uh, Greece, and uh, it pains me to say this as a Greek historian, <laughs> Greece uh, almost doesn't register because it's, it's not even a blip. Um, so uh, that, really, that really raises big questions uh, for me. Um, so, uh, obviously, one conclusion that uh, one thing that Ian has argued very strongly is that we really should look at global uh, antiquity. Uh, one could also then follow it up and say, well, what, um, why stop, for example, as Ian did yesterday at, at 600 AD as the end of antiquity? Is there anything that sets that period apart from what follows, uh, again, until 1400 or maybe even 1800 with the Industrial Revolution? Is that all basically one big antiquity except different from modernity? Um, and so should we not only be looking at a global antiquity, but the whole history before the Industrial Revolution as uh, one essentially undivided period? So these are some of the questions that we, uh, we will be addressing. I would throw into the mix, because I mentioned it in the initial blurb for this, uh, this, this workshop, uh, maybe a third perspective, um, which used to be pretty popular, I think, and perhaps no longer widely accepted, but the idea that even if we don't set Greece and Rome aside on the basis of some special cultural significance uh, you know, for subsequent European history or culture. Um, perhaps there is an argument to be made for Greece and Rome being in some other way distinctive in the ancient world very globally and, and widely defined. Um, and I'm thinking here specifically of, of uh, Moses Finley's model in the ancient economy, which made uh, a point of arguing that uh, the ancient economy, at least, um, was sufficiently distinct from the rest of the ancient Greek and Roman economies, were sufficiently distinct from other ancient societies to be put together uh, and had enough in common, uh, sorry, that they were sufficiently distinct to be separated from the others and they had enough in common to be put together as an ancient economy. Um, so, uh, I say that, that argument is uh, not very widely accepted anymore at all, um, but that would be potentially another way of looking at antiquity. You know, is there anything distinctive in Greek and Roman history or what other definition of antiquity we might like to come up with um, that justifies separating it out as something different from that whole global and enormous chronological span that, uh, that Ian has so brilliantly managed to cover. Um, and then, of course, the question also arises about the concept of antiquity as such. Um, you know, uh, Corinna's response yesterday questioned that. You know, what, what do we mean by antiquity? Is it not the case that basically every society and culture has perhaps, I, I overstate your case, but has its own uh, antiquity, that uh, you know, there isn't just a single model of antiquity. And this is in particular where the, the, the Chinese uh, story comes in, uh, where we might have, uh, we certainly have a concept of antiquity as well, but perhaps used in significantly different ways, or indeed in parallel ways, and we'll, we'll hear about that uh, later. Um, finally, finally, in a, a, a nod to the, the bigger project, uh, which all this is part, the, the Credoc project, the Center for Research in the uh, uh, Dynamics of Civilization. Um, it's worth saying, because uh, perhaps Ian didn't uh, say that much about, about his work in that direction, but he has posited 
um, a very uh, strong and clear model as to what the development of the dynamics of civilization actually are. Uh, and I think, if, uh, correct me if I do you a massive injustice, uh, but the fundamental drive towards development uh, in his uh, first book, anyway, uh, which I confess is the only one I really read thoroughly, so <laughs> I'm not going beyond that. Um, the, his first book, uh, that the drives are, and I, I quote, I think, um, uh, lazy, greedy, frightened people <laughs> trying to find ways to make uh, things a bit easier, uh, uh, easier, more profitable, and safe <laughs> for themselves as the fundamental drive. This then we, we, we did hear that yesterday to four structural processes that he had identified um, ultimately state restructuring, intellectual restructuring, geographical expansion, uh, and economic growth. These are the four major processes uh, that resulted from these drives. Um, and these, um, we didn't hear about those yesterday, but um, they are highly relevant to the, to the story. Um, these processes are then frequently interrupted by what are Again, memorably called the, the five horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, and these five are, um, uh, you can think of them so yourselves, but climate change, uh, migration, um, uh, uh, epidemic disease, famine, uh, and state collapse. I think if, I, I hope I remember all the factors where you put that. You know. um, we will have plenty of uh, room for, uh, for discussion perhaps later on if we want to, uh, to take this further. But that is uh, you know, a really unusual case of someone daring to formulate a very clear and strong model and say, well, these are the dynamics of civilization. And so if we all agree, we can then abolish the tree dock and uh, live happily ever after. Um, but uh, for now, we're going to hear from a whole range of colleagues who have very uh, frankly agreed to, to speak on this, uh, on this theme, on aspects of the theme. Um, and first of all, it's over to uh, Eleanor Robson, Professor of Engineering Eastern History at UCL, um, who is going to be uh, telling us uh, what uh, trying to get us to rethink Middle Eastern antiquity. Eleanor. First of all, a bit of an apology. In my rush to get out of my final class yesterday afternoon, I um, left my Mac adapter um, in the um, um, in that room. So I've just hurriedly transferred my carefully pre prepared PowerPoint onto this PC. We, all we're missing are the pretty, the pretty UCL headers and I think one image. So I hope it will work. So I am, in the traditional sense, not an ancient historian. I have no Greek, I have no Latin. I was trained in the Middle Eastern Studies Department. I'm a historian of Iraq. I happen to work on the, most, the oldest bits, but I also happen to work on some of the, the newest bits too. So what I want to do today is think about what we mean by antiquity from, uh, from the point of view of the Middle East rather than from the Mediterranean. And I want to say to you, my, my um, conceit running through this talk, I think, is that antiquity is like the ocean. It has great unplumbed depths. It is a single entity, and yet there are parts of it which are significantly different, have significantly different um, ecological systems in them to others. And that it is useful to look at the whole, but it is equally useful, and I, I would argue vital, to understand individual parts of it too. So, let's start with the first question. Antiquity is like the ocean. So how deep does it go if it's like the ocean? So Ian yesterday was talking a lot about the first millennium BC and really talking particularly about the Axial Age, the period that begins in the 8th century, so the argument goes, in which there are many big uh, changes across the whole of uh, Eurasia. Now, from a uh, historian of Iraq's point of view, 800 BC, pa! History, the writing begins in, um, in southern Iraq, also in Egypt, um, more or less 5,000 years ago. So we are talking deep time. In terms of prehistorians, I mean, I've, I've taught students of the Paleolithic, you'll say 3000 BC, pa! Right? <laughs> we are really skimming the surface of that deep ocean, however deep we think we go. Right? So, here is the period that Ian was talking about yesterday, the so-called axial age. And that is, thinking about, in terms of ocean depths, a really great period to, to, to look across 
deep, uh, wide spans of antiquity because our ocean of antiquity is wide, widespread to that depth. And indeed, we can see as um, the Middle East enters the actual axial age, those huge transitions in scale. So here is the Assyrian Empire, ruler of the Middle East in the early first millennium BC. At that point, the largest empire the world had ever known. And hey, that looks pretty big, doesn't it? That's pretty much all of the inhabitable Middle East. And there are a couple of brief periods which, when it encompasses Egypt too. Then along comes the Persians, and watch Assyria shrink. That's our previous map. There is the Persian Empire. Right? So suddenly, my little part of the world, southern Iraq, looks incredibly insignificant on that scale. But what southern Iraq has going for it is incredible chronological depth. So, from the point of view of the material I'm working on at the moment, the Axical Age is not antiquity. It is the far future. It is 800 years in the future. For my guys, this is thinking about Star Trek. It's unimaginably a, a long time in the future. So what can we do with um, material from the early 2nd millennium BC? Let me give you a little example from the stuff. This is really, really fresh, right? So you think... 1800 BC, that's an awful long time ago. Surely we must know everything there is to know about it already. Quite the opposite. There is new stuff coming out of the ground all the time. I was in Iraq just three weeks ago. I'm a member of a project um, that's run from the University of Manchester, jointly with the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, and partly funded by the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. I'm not myself an archaeologist. I leave that to the experts. I'm the one that reads the objects, the inscribed objects, as they come out of the ground. So it's an incredibly collaborative experience. There's Brits, there's Iraqis, there are professional archaeologists, there are academic archaeologists, there are students. And we are together trying to make sense in real time of what the diggers are finding. We've been going for three seasons now, a little brief one in 2013, um, three months last year, two months this year. We picked the site, or the, the um, dig directors, Jane Moon, Robert Killick and, and Stuart Campbell picked the site because it was of a manageable size. They picked it also because aerial photography showed very close to the surface a very large building that looked accessible and um, unusual. So here it is at the end of uh, last spring, and you can see even just on the surface scrape, huge walls coming out of the ground, but also some rather peculiar little, um, particularly over there, you can see these little things that looked at first like buttresses turn out to be little external rooms, so they're rather mysterious. I will also point out that round thing in the middle, which I will get to in a second. Within a couple of days of their first dig, they, digging, they hit clay tablets in cuneiform script. Um, None of the um, diggers um, were cuneiform literate. I happened to be in the country at the time, and I was summoned down from Baghdad to um, read the tablets. Now that we've been going for three seasons, I can confidently say that we definitely have not just sort of random deposits of, of written stuff, but a very meaningful assemblage of, of written evidence. We're well into, into history. The tablets all come from two rooms in the big mysterious administrative building, um, this is a plan from the end of last season. We've now mapped out more. Um, what you've got up the, this, all along the side here are rows of, of storage rooms, which were, we think, containing grain and other agricultural products. And that's definitely what the cuneiform tablets are telling us. So, this is not hot off the press. It's not even in the press yet. This is the, these are all the <coughs> second lot of people I've talked to about this in the first outside Iraq. So you're very, very privileged. We have... A few dozen administrative tablets ranging in size from this big to this big. They're documenting uh, well-managed but quite informal um, agricultural production centre. We see the same names of people coming up again and again. They, the managers of the community, or perhaps one single individual, it's, are small in number, it's not a big hierarchy because there's no formal administrative apparatus on the tablet that give us names of um, 
professional, gives us the names or titles of professional administrators. It seems to be a one-man band writing for himself. But nevertheless, keeping um, very close track, and my favourite tablet actually is a list of three, three workers who have been behaving improperly. Um, and so we have to find out, quite, I haven't quite finished reading exactly what they've done. But clearly there is discipline involved. So, a small community, 30 or 40 um, men involved. They're distinguished um, from each other by their first names, and if they have synonymous first names, then the administrator uses uh, a professional title such as um, carpenter or scribe or seal cutter, which shows that these are people not permanently involved in agriculture but are doing other things in the community too. Um, so, again, that, that's very, very helpful. Dating it is rather difficult but also very exciting because these, both the tablets, the, the um, paleography of the script, but also the material assemblage of the objects coming out of the ground around them, tell us that this is from a period which is not meant to be literate. Famous King Hammurabi's successor and son, Samsara Luna, lost the south of Iraq to a mysterious Sealand dynasty who ruled from somewhere in the marshes in either 1630 or 1730 BC, depending on your uh, views about um, Middle Bronze Age chronology. And writing, it is generally thought, disappeared from, from the area. There are a small group of tablets illicitly excavated and sold on the antiquities market a few years ago that date to a seven-year period towards the end of that floating three, we can't pinpoint it. And the reason we can't pinpoint it is that at this point in history, years were named rather than counted. So in order to know relative chronology, you have to know the, the, the sequence in which years were named after political events. And we don't have the lists for this period. We also know that in about 510 BC, administrators stopped naming years and started counting them as well. We have one very fragmentary year name in our little group of tablets, so that tells us that it must predate 510 and post-date either um, 1730 or 1630. We know that um, there is, um, they are part of a much larger um, political system because we have three references to deliveries of grain to the palace. Now, if only they told us where the palace was, then that would be a major um, uh, excitement because that would solve the problem of where the Sealand dynasty ruled from. You think it's probably the city of Ur. But nevertheless, we've got then very new and exciting stuff about the, um, the organisation of society in a period which was traditionally thought of as being rather chaotic. Even better than that, that though, is that just this and these last couple of months, there is evidence for formal scribal training in this administrative building too. And this was completely unexpected. The small communities, you expect people to be learning on the job, learning the signs that they need to know in order to do their jobs. You don't expect them to be learning the formal sort of schooling that was happening in big cities and that is in part of the indoctrination and, self, and creation of self-identity of scribal um, communities. But our guys, our mysterious... Um, administrators whom we don't yet know, um, were teaching one or more uh, successors how to write not just words for grain and deliveries and um, uh, badly behaved workers, but elephants and hippopotamuses and lapis lazuli and carnelian. And so their intellectual world is so much larger than their small brown agricultural world of southern Iraq. They're, um, they're thinking about and dreaming about a much more beautiful, colourful, um, larger world in common with their counterparts in the big cities before or afterwards. So that, for me, is incredibly exciting. What's lovely about this is the tablets, we know exactly, because the we're working, working on them as they come out, out of the ground, exactly where they're found. The administrative tablets that you saw um, before are generally very complete. They had obviously been deliberately kept and then... Um, the building had been abandoned and the tablets left in situ. They're in this, the building with this mysterious round um, installation, which is a um, very typical um, recycling facility for clay tablets. Not typically baked in antiquity. When you finished um, 
with a document that had yet run out of, it, of useful life, you chucked it back in the bin, put water on it, and sort of um, squished it down and, and made them again. So that's very typical, usually, of school tablets. Now, the bin itself was clean, but all the administrative bill tablets were found around here, and all of the school tablets had been broken up in antiquity and chucked in a corner over there. So it'd be like finding the, 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 sort of the bottom of a waste paper basket, basically. So again, very, very exciting um, to think about new, new horizons for literacy in, um, at the end of a period that we know very, very well, extending the range there. So I said then, from, from my point of view at the moment, axial age really very modern. Even at this period, they were very, very aware that they were, um, that the literate community was sitting on deep, deep antiquity. You, some of you may know about the Sumerian King List. This is its most famous exemplar here in the, uh, near here in the Ashmolean Museum, but we have uh, 20 or so manuscripts of it now. Now, I wonder if I can... I'm not familiar with PCs. Would you bear with me a second? What I want to do is come to... Uh, there. So the Sumerian King List... Mis li exists in many um, versions, <coughs> but it divides the, the past from the point of view of the early 2nd millennium BC into two. The most recent part is just like the early 2nd millennium present, and you find a bit that's not got too many variants in, um, in which kings rule for 20 years or five. They rule in dynasties um, from particular cities. Cities, kingship moves from city to city. Right. And that historical past, from the point of view of the early 2nd millennium BC, is a very deep one. Right. So here we are at line 300 odd, right, 350. But the past, the early 2nd millennium people understood, had not been going on like this forever. They divided the past into um, historical time like this, and then a time before the flood. And I am, there we are. And that it was the flood that, that distinguishes <coughs> historical, quantifiable time from what we might call prehistory or a golden age. And there are other myths, there are much more perhaps um, textually interesting myths than this, that describe the gods creating humankind in order to look after them but failing to build in any um, sort of self-regulating mechanism for breeding or, or dying. So that population just keeps breeding, human population keeps breeding and breeding and breeding and never dying, um, and so they become intolerably noisy to the gods, and the flood is the f a, a solution that the, the gods create in order to, to, to limit human population. And in this time, then, kings rule for incredible lengths of time because they are, to all extents and purposes, immortal. So, for someone in the 18th century BC, they can see back very, very far in time, too. Right, so we can say antiquity is like the ocean, it's very, very deep. Antiquity is not quite like the ocean in that we're not quite agreed as to where it stops, right? where the surface of the ocean lies. And this is particularly the case for the Middle East, I think. Here are the standard textbooks in circulation at the moment, in, in use at least Anglophone books that we set our students. Famously, Emily Kurtz, Ancient Near East, who says that the ancient... Oh, that should have been 330 BC, sorry, my typo. 330... Um, Van der Meerup, a decade later, 323. Notice this is all about relinquishing the Middle East to Alexander the Great. Right? At this point, his Middle Eastern experts can stop and hand over to the classicists. Uh, French historian Francis Ioannis thinks, begs to differ and says that the ancient Near East stops, Mesopotamia stops, with the last datable cuneiform tablet 400-odd years later. And then, curiously, Liverani, most recently, rolls back from then and says, no, it's not, it's not the Greeks, it's not cuneiform, let's call a halt at the Persians. 
Right. So there may well be good pragmatic reasons for this, but it sends very clear signals to our students that Middle Eastern specialists can hand over at some point, but perhaps with a big sigh of relief. An alternative, also recent, is a book called Ancient Empires from Mesopotamia to the Rise of Islam, which situates the Middle East in a Mediterranean and European context. It starts with Assyria in the first millennium BC, then sweeps west and then comes back to the Umayyad dynasty, the first dynasty of Islam, and argues that that is the last of the ancient empires. So that's a very interesting take too, that's a very definite date, but then that's this very clear message that the Middle East is a precursor to, to the European history. Karen Radner and I, a couple of years ago, ducked the question, or rather said the question wasn't a, a, a very useful one, and in fact, if we're thinking, going back to our um, ocean um, metaphor, then thinking rather about ecosystems within the past. And one natural cluster is to look at communities that bind together by particular writing cultures, because we are, for, after all, historians and think uh, access the past um, through um, primarily through the written world word, even if, as cuneiformists, we see that written word as having very um, clear archaeological context and very clear material form. But what that doesn't do then is acknowledge um, uh, multiple literacies, multilinguality and, and hybridity, which is particular, um, well, it's particularly visible perhaps in the first millennium BC, but is present throughout Middle Eastern antiquity. I also think the problem of stopping with Islam is it then um, prevents one from looking at, at continuities. And one of my favourite courses to teach um, starts with the Assyrians and ends, um, and ends um, just with the coming of the Ottoman Empire and looks at continuities and change in kingship and, and scholarship throughout that period. So, who owns the sea? Who owns antiquity? Questions for the Middle East are particularly complex and contested, and we've seen that no more so than in recent weeks, since, um, particularly since the release by ISIS of the videos of them trashing objects in the um, Mosul Museum. So, let me... You've all seen media um, on this. Let me give you um, <coughs> some examples of this sort of great sense of entitlement and ownership that appear um, in the mainstream media. In the, right, so here is Boris Johnson saying that this is absolute outrage and that he's ready to, to bear arms and go and shoot them down as, as a result of the destruction of the Assyrian Empire. Since when has Boris cared about the Assyrian Empire? I don't know. Um, I mean, he's well known for his classical interest, but this is the first time I've ever seen him in print expressing any opinion. What's interesting too, and I think what's deeply problematic, is he sees the past, uh, the heritage of the past, as something that is essentially rightfully ours, or something British. Right? There, is, there are the heroic Victorian explorers who rescued this stuff from the Middle East and took it safe to the British Museum in the 19th century, and then there are the rampaging iconoclasts of the Middle East today. There is no room in this st story for the, um, the academic Iraqi, the educated member of the public, the person who just wants to go have a picnic on an ancient site. People own the past in the Middle East just as they do here, and there is a local um, right to, of access to this stuff. Jonathan Jones in The Guardian, on the very same day, was bewailing why um, there's a day in which um, news had been reported that Saddam's tomb had been trashed in fighting into Crete. And he, he wailed then about, why are we worrying about this when the whole of the Assyrian Empire has been destroyed? I've, I've lost the link to that, again, because I'm not on my own laptop. But, and I remembered that just exactly a year ago, he had written this article also in The Guardian, um, really generally decrying uh, Assyria, ending this. Egypt increased for civilizations, Assyria was not. Assyrian art is indeed cursed by the blood and gore it celebrates. 
Syrian art itself cast an evil spell. So that's how much Jonathan Jones loves the ancient Middle East, right? Saeed's Orientalism much, folks. We tend to think, oh, God, 1978, been there, done that. And yet, and yet, and yet, we, keep, we do need to keep teaching it to our students. It is all pervasive. Middle Eastern antiquity is ours, the West's. Middle Eastern antiquity is corrupt and decadent. I also had, but you can find it for yourself, a tweet from the ancient historian Tom Holland. Again, that de- two, three days later. Is ISIS destroying everything I love? So, oh, come on. Your life, you know, your home, your life, your family are completely safe. Um, and really, it's not about us. If you want to know more, you want to hear more about my ranting about this, this week's TLS. I have a long rant in that, so I'll shut up about that now. I want to finish off by thinking um, a little bit about how we've got there, how, how it is that um, anglophone men, white men, can um, claim um, ownership of, of the Middle Eastern past and forget that there are potential Middle Eastern claimants too. So, um, Ian was very usefully uh, yesterday think, uh, urging us to think about 18th century views of antiquity. 18th century views of antiquity hardly encompass the Middle East. It's what was bits from the Bible, bits from the classics, but there were no primary sources. Art historian Frederick Burra has called the Middle East a new antiquity. So although it is much deeper than other, other um, local antiquities, it is in fact incredibly new. And it has taken the Anglophone world, the Western world, an incredibly long time to come to terms with it. First discoveries fit in chronologically with Greece and Rome. Assyria predates them by a few hundred years. Okay, no big deal. Cuneiform script, when it's deciphered, corroborates a lot of stuff in the Bible, throws up some interesting anomalies. That's all okay. That all fits into the known picture. 1870s, major, major um, intellectual catastrophe in that southern Iraq starts to be explored. Archaeological techniques are such that we can no, no longer just looking for stone sculpture, but mud brick buildings become apparent too. And oh, there's a whole civilization out there that the Bible and the classical world know nothing about, written in the Sumerian language and much, much deeper in time. It takes 30 years for Anglophone academia to agree that Sumerian is indeed a real language, that these are real people, and it's not just the Assyrians having us on. So, but you know, hey folks, that's 115 years ago. We should have got over that by now, and yet somehow not. Partly, the Brits are to blame. When, after the First World War, um, the Middle East was cut up into Iraq and Syria and other places, Britain was given um, the new country of Iraq to mandate into modernity. And to a large extent, it was um, archaeologists in charge because they were the ones who spoke Arabic, they were the ones who knew the region, and they were the ones, for better or worse, who were particularly fussed about... um, accessing um, the region's past. Gertrude Bell had been phenomenally important in setting up the country and creating a very British-style monarchy there. But once all that was over, she was sidelined and given antiquities and heritage to look after. Sorry, some of the words are banged into her picture. And she very much treated it as her local fiefdom. And indeed, the British Museum lobbied very, very hard that the British should retain a complete monopoly on excavation. She was sensible enough not to allow that and allowed French and Germans and Americans in too, but made no attempt to train um, Iraqis. There were even, in, well, well after her death in the ni- in, uh, as late as ni- 1935, an American um, commission decreed that Iraq was not ready for tertiary education, that, that a university would be more trouble than it was worth. And so history, archaeology, um, the constructing of the idea of the nation state remained very firmly in anglophone hands. And despite a great deal of public unrest and agitation against this, and if you're interested in this, Magnus Bernhardson's excellent book, Create... Um, um, my black plundered past something a plundered past um, from 2005 is very very good 
So when the man mandate um, ended in 1932, at last there was a chance for Iraqis themselves to establish um, their own sense of history. And ironically, it was a, um, a Yemeni, Sati al-Husri, who'd been um, trained in, um, in the old Ottoman Empire and became the Iraq's first Minister of Education and first Director General of Antiquities, who started to send the first gener uh, generation away to be trained, not in um, formerly colonial countries, but in the United States. And the first to actually seriously explore the Islamic past of the country. And only once that had got underway, then started to go back further in time again to the, um, for instance, to the Arab city of Hatra, and then um, spending a lot of time, or particularly to Habaqa, um, on the old Babylonian period, the early second millennium BC during the Second World War. And then, it's got a very long story, thought things got very messy under Saddam um, when the ancient past became co opted to um, create a sense of Iraq that was. Um, in which Saddam was merely the latest in a long line of militaristic heroic kings, where the Hammurabi of Babylon, um, Sennacherib of Assyria, or Salah Adin, the anti-crusader from um, the Kurdish north. And this involved, well, there were good reasons for this in some ways, and that trying to create an Iraqi identity that went beyond Shia and Sunni, beyond Christian and Muslim, beyond Kurdish speakers and Arabic speakers, a past that no one had privileged access to. But because it became so closely associated with their re regime and had to fit in to that very totalitarian secret police state, it became very badly corrupted too used also against um, the Iranians, particularly in the Iran-Iraq war. Here you see Saddam either firing um, rainbows or Exocet missiles, depending on your preference, against the evil Iranians. Oh, I'm missing a picture. Um, 2003, the war there didn't, didn't help very much either. In um, the, a lot of the looting was either very um, anti-Ba'athist, people seeing the ancient past as very... Too, too much a part of the regime's propaganda, or um, an unfortunate sort of biased, um, sort of collateral damage in the regime's own destruction of its um, of its records, and then lots and lots of archaeological looting in the aftermath, partly by criminal gangs and partly people who were just desperate to feed themselves and their families. Over the past ten years in the south, things are gradually coming back together again, but it is still the case that I know far more about the, the history of ancient Iraq than almost any Iraqi. When I go to the country, my Arabic isn't good enough to talk to my colleagues in Arabic. It's not good enough to give lectures to students in Arabic. And so I'm still in this very asymmetric, um, privileged position, and it makes me very uncomfortable. So, let's wrap up. Morals and the story. So, antiquity is far bigger than any of us can possibly encompass and it's all exciting and deep and rich and there are huge huge uncharted territories out there even in parts of the world which we think are familiar and I'm sure anyone who works on any other part of the world can point to similar um, lacunae that need filling so our little project at El Haiba is just creeping towards closing one of those little gaps local histories are just as important as the global and by local histories, I mean histories for people who live there, not, for, not just for us. Right? Iraqis enjoy and value their local history just as we do. We mustn't forget that. And in fact, we, we have a moral obligation to help them access it. And I think this is also very important. I'm afraid this is the one point in which I, I beg to differ with Ian from yesterday. He was arguing very strongly that um, the Greco-Roman... Uh, world is particularly important. I would simply say it is particularly familiar. If we go back to our, our ocean metaphor, it's part of the oceans that have been not overfished, but very heavily fished, let's say. Right? And just because it's close to us and near to us, it may seem important to us right now, but 
Is it necessary? I would argue not. And I think it's just as important to get out in, into the unfamiliar territory and explore those two. And they may turn out to be just as important and exciting and confusing and um, fascinating as, as the familiar Greco-Roman world. This is important too. I think this is really important. I think we have a, particularly if we're working on tic- and antiquities of the world outside Europe, and even if we are, Right? But we are, we are the privileged few. Right? We are the one. Our lives will never be at risk by what we do. Right? I have colleagues who have risked their lives. To, one in particular I'm thinking of who went out when the, the Daily Mail had a stupid <gasps> ISIS have destroyed the walls of Nineveh thing on the 31st of January. A colleague of mine got in his car and he drove around the walls of Nineveh in ISIS occupied Mosul just to go just so that we could tell the, the Daily Mail they were wrong. Right? Mm. They're working without books. They're working without internet. They're um, working um, in incredibly difficult situations, and yet they continue to do that. Encouraging local communities and our own communities beyond the academia to understand antiquity, to make it more accessible, can only be a good thing. Having a strong sense of your past is going to be nothing but good for social cohesion. It helps people understand the value of difference rather than being frightened of difference, understanding that people are people despite their variety and that there is value and interest to be had in learning from other people too. So, here's the plea then for going deep as well as for going broad and for staying particular as well as... um, as exploring the general. Thank you very much. No. Yeah. Okay. This is all. Um, I think we're going to have a, a roving microphone for questions, so that it can all be properly recorded. Well, but just to, uh, I thought I'd just done, and I'm not. <laughs> Just to, uh, to say thanks to uh, Eleanor, first of all, for a, a very important uh, contribution uh, to today. Uh, the, the, the challenge, as it were, to global history uh, uh, by putting a, a local, a deep local history in uh, amongst, maybe not in its place, but alongside it, I guess, is, uh, is really very important. And there are many other aspects there. The, um, the indigenous perception of antiquity, I guess, uh, the, the modern periodizations of antiquity um, are only just two other elements of the... Of the uh, uh, the material covered here, and I think all of them very relevant to today. So, any questions on any of those angles would be very welcome. Thank you very much for the paper. That was really exciting and uh, new field work uh, showing uh, the, the local in, in this little gap and a reminder that. The, the, the ocean sometimes dries up in the middle in a strange way. Uh, that's, that's really uh, amazing material. It's quite close to the period I study in Egypt, so of course I'm particularly interested in it. But I, on, on a more general level, um, this relationship between the local and the global, it's a mm-hmm. kind of an urban conceit, I guess, that we have, that the local isn't global. And mm-hmm. you're showing that uh, the two are imbricated in one another. There's this kind of emission. At what point do you think the local is truly local? I, I'm thinking of... Um, kind of rural localities today where usually they've been to more continents than I have uh, because they need the work and then they go home again afterwards but I I wondered whether you thought within these qualities of locality and and global there was something local that you could isolate away from the global or are they too enmeshed? I think think they're just it's a question of, of how tight your focus is Right, and change metaphors now. So yes, our little village, our Tel Hiver, our little excavation, we thought it was just going to be this little agricultural community. We weren't expecting, they weren't expecting tablets, right? And when we got tablets, I wasn't expecting them to tell us anything about other than that little world. In fact, we've got links to a palatial economy, the, um, the scribal exercise tablets give us links to this incredibly large sort of world of the imagination. So, you know, even at that scale, you can't help but have to acknowledge kingdoms and trade networks 
um, you know, lapis, we've got, you know, the lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, for instance, and, you know, and we, we've not yet done, we've actually got some semi-pressure sewn on site, we've not yet done the analysis that's going up, they've gone up to Manchester for that. It's just grubby colour stone at the moment, we can't tell what it is, but that's not local, we don't, you know, local stone is limestone, right? So, again, I, I think... You know, I think even, or even when we are studying the, sort of the, the palace, you can get so wrapped up in what's going on within the, the household. You can, you can do both, I think. And I, I don't know. I don't think you can ever cut one off from the other. Because quite precisely, you say that even now there's deeply connected um, things. That, that was a really rambling answer. Sorry. Karina? Well, I think the, the, the recording might pick you up. I'll in first. Thank you. I was really interested about this relationship between what Syria happens to be portrayed as in the media, as bloody, uh, corrupt, violent, uh, and what, you know, the, the advancement of research that steps so far away from that. Um, and the reason why I was wondering what you make of that relationship is because when you set up the slide showing the sort of uh, chronology of the new antiquity as yeah. it was established in the 19th century, it reminded me that exactly at that point in time, uh, Etruscan antiquity was being you know, properly fashioned almost as an academic discipline. Uh, and that's where the Etruscans began to appear to everyone's eyes as bloody, violent, oriental. Uh, and that bloodiness, violence, and oriental status of the Etruscans has remained uh, in much of the literature, scholarly literature, because Etruscan archaeology is classical and therefore portrayed by the classical sources just like that. So there is almost a continuity I think so. that remains in the scholarship. So I was wondering what happens with, well, I think with what the I, Middle Eastern archaeology. I, th I, th I think, I think the, the two um, trajectories are very, very much parallel. And we, you know, the, the, the late, late 19th century, late, um, the intellectual world of, of, of London and Paris and Berlin and places like that is one of increasing racial discourse. It's about science. In the scientific study of race ever more so, whether it's through modern anatomy or the ancient past. Um, and that, whether it's social Darwinism or um, nascent anti-Semitism, there's a lot of it about. And so that happens naturally. And one of the excitements I, of discovering the Sumerians is it's not a Semitic language, right? And therefore it can be claimed as this sort of pure origin without having to worry about so there's huge huge arguments about whether the origins of civilizations are Semitic i.e. Babylonian and Assyrian or non-Semitic i.e. Sumerian um, so and the um, the newly created German state gets heavily involved in that heavily invested in archaeological investigation in the Middle East precisely for this point so and it's been Unfortunately, the history of, of archaeology has focused, um, generally speaking, on the first generation of pioneer explorers and decipherers, the heroic men who did the firsts of the 1840s and 50s. And there's very, beyond my own students' work and, and a few exceptions outside, very little historicization of the of what happened. The idea is that you just discover it and then that's it, there is no history to write, right? Um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done on how, how the past is constructed through the lens of late 19th century, early 20th century modernity. But I, I'm still uh, you know, baffled by this uh, big disjunction between what the media make of Assyria, as, as you pointed out. I mean, I've read your piece in, yeah. the, in the TLS, and, you know, and, and you know, clearly you, the way that scholars mm. speak to the media, as you do in the TLS, is... This is not like that, so I'm just um, baffled by this because, incredible because disjunction. Because Iraq is inaccessible. It's been inaccessible for 25 years. You know, international, you know, the UN international sanctions made Iraq a pariah state. So it, we can construct it, the West constructs it however they like. When they go to Iraq, they go to the green zone, right, in a tiny, tiny little bit of, of Baghdad in which the rest of the world is described, the rest of the country is described as the red zone. Right? And... 
if you're in the green zone, you're allowed out for 90 minutes at a time in an armed, in an armored vehicle with a flak jacket and a tin hat. I had to fight for 48 hours to be allowed to go and visit my colleague who runs the National Library when I stupidly accepted an invitation to stay at the British Embassy in Baghdad. Um, so they, I'm really weird in that I travel with Iraqis in the country. Right? People are increasingly doing that in Kurdistan, but that beyond Kurdistan, it's incredibly unusual. And so yeah, people, sorry, yeah, to, uh, yeah. There were several people who wanted to ask questions, yeah. and we'll have, but we'll have time to come, yeah. to, uh, come back yeah. to this uh, in the uh, in the general discussion at the end. Okay, Maria, so if you are uh, all over wanting to ask a question, then Maria is up next. <laughs> Yes, I was really interested in the way that you were um, presenting the importance of the, the local in relation mm. to the global. Mm. And I wondered whether one other way of thinking about that relationship might be to say that, um, that, that there is a way of looking at the global with a, with a God's eye view, that we look down yeah. from above yeah. and we think um, that we can see from mm. above this spread of um, civilizations and this, this global antiquity, and that what you're adding to that, in a way, is also an opportunity to look at the global, but to look at the global from the local, that when yeah. you look from the local at the global, you might see it... Yeah, quickly. it and is. So um, one, of, one of the issues for us is that we're looking at the global from our position yeah, in the yeah, Mediterranean, yeah. and that might make a difference yeah. to the yeah, way yeah. we see it. So my, it. Absolutely, it's one of my former colleagues in Cambridge who used to like to say, all knowledge is situated, right? Mm -hmm. And whether it's from above or below or from the east or the west, we're going to... Just what is perceptible from that position is going to be different. Um, we, and that's why we just need to keep talking to each other and telling, us, telling each other what we see and hoping it all joins up and makes some sort of sense between us. So I'm not saying that one is privileged over the other, but that they're all valuable and that the panoptic is as important as the microscopic. I mean, following that point about the, um, uh, as you say, digging deep mm. or going deep, in a way, the deep, how deep does antiquity go in that respect? Because if you dig really deep, then you're into a sort of a prehistory which finally ends up, what, you know, 100,000 years ago and everybody comes out of Africa. So actually you end up in a, a, another kind of panopticon. Yeah. View. And, but it's quite interesting to you know uh, not what the lateral spread is, but what does deepness mean? Well, I mean, if we're talking as historians in terms of survival of, of legible text, if we take that crude... Well, I'm saying if we do, that's one measure of doing it, right? And that's a, but you don't do practice. Well, I'm a historian, I do. I don't know anything about the Paleolithic period. I know that there were... The Shan no, the Shanadar caves exist. Yeah, so I, yeah, in yeah, culture. yeah. But I always have been, yeah. But that's what is what what Middle Eastern historians do because all of our stuff comes out of the ground, right? We I mean, maybe have to be re-excavated in museums, but we all work with material objects. That's one of the major, major differences between so methodology the, yeah. of, of, of the classical world and the, and the antique. Is that it was lost for millennia, right? We don't have a continued tradition of learning. This is, this is Berber's point. It all had to be rediscovered and it all had to come out of the ground. So, again, that gives us, that just necessarily forces us in a different way of thinking because we don't have a continuous tradition. Uh, this is probably not on. Um, if there are no immediate questions, so we have a, a lot of time for discussion um, at the end, um, more than an hour, I think about an hour, um, so it might be a good idea to, uh, to move uh, on to our, our next speaker, but let's uh, thank Eleanor again for, for a wonderful paper. <laughs>
the Renaissance when it's all revived. Um, and I, th I think we talked briefly at the end of the last discussion about uh, periodization and how, well, where does it start, where does it, does it end? Uh, and I guess this will be uh, one of the questions that we, uh, that we uh, should, should really address. Uh, to what extent uh, does ancient history simply continue straight into the Middle Ages, or to the extent of the Middle Ages simply extend all the way back to uh, prehistory, for all we know? Um, uh, and I'm sure there are many other aspects that David will address too. So, David. Uh, good. I, I need to have this thing. I take I, I'm just saying you probably do. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, so, uh, I uh, wasn't at the lecture yesterday, but I have read the paper um, with um, pleasure and profit, and I've um, uh, also um, read the paper from um, a distinguished visitor from Peking, um, and I will allude to those as I go along, though my brief, as Hans gave it to me, was to talk about antiquity in the Middle Ages, but I think it does all tie together. So first of all, I think we, we just need to stand back and make a couple of obvious points about how we use concepts. Um, as you see from the handout, um, the, the w w social scientists, anthropologists, historians distinguish between emic and etic concepts. That is to say, the, the concepts of the people that we're studying, the emic concepts and the concepts of the analytical observer, the historian or anthropologist, social scientist, and we need to think about in which sense we are using the trio of antiquity, Middle Ages, and indeed modern. Um, in fact, uh, in my own view, uh, one really needs to add a third to this trio. Um, there's the concepts of the people we're studying, which are almost invariably, well, they're part of what we study. They're, in a way, the key part of what we study but um, they are confused and fuzzy as people's concepts as they battle their way through lives tend to be. Then there's the concepts of our own society, 21st century Britain, America, wherever, and these are also confused and fuzzy. And neither sets of concepts are fit for purpose for scholarly analysis um, because they're not designed for it. They're designed for getting by in their own period. So the third set of concepts are the concepts which, I guess, are etic concepts in the thin sense, which are the concepts that we scholars devise in order to understand what we study. And I think it's very important to segregate these from the concepts of our own time, um, in that they are created for a purpose, and that purpose is to study the past. So uh, they are often very similar to the concepts of our own time, but not absolutely the same. So uh, the, if you take a couple of um, Weberian concepts, the concept of a pariah people sounds very negative, but in fact what it means is a people, or indeed an individual who is the underdog, who is oppressed, um, uh, who can't fight back for the moment, but knows that their people's time will come. And that's a very transferable concept, or again, Weber's concept of charisma. It's not one of magnetism, but it's the belief by the followers of, uh, of a person, in the case of personal charisma, that that person has extraordinary powers. So these are slightly specially defined concepts, and they're defined in order to give you the sort of precision you need to understand the past. And uh, that is what I mean by etic concepts in this sense. And I, I say that because otherwise people say, if you don't, you know, you cannot escape from the concepts of your time. Well, in a way you can, because you can create concepts in the hothouse of your own academic subculture, and that is very different from your own time, from the world out there. Um, okay, so how does this map onto our debate today? Ancient, medieval, and modern. Well, First up, these are clearly emic concepts. I mean, their origin is in the societies we study. They, they're not um, concepts that were invented by modern intellectuals or scholars in order to understand the past. They're a product of the past. And secondly, they are a rather peculiar product of the past in that the, the concept of the ancient uh, was developed about a thousand years uh, after antiquity as we now understand it. 
So the concept of antiquity or of the ancient world is developed in by humanists. I'm not going to throw around, around the word renaissance too much. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's another very um, um, thick, seamy uh, concept full of confusion. Um, but let's say humanists who are guys who are keen to propagate a new academic and school curriculum. And this is the school curriculum that um, is, uh, was alive and well until um, not all that long ago. Two of my colleagues um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, who went to St. Paul's with three other people, um, with um, Martin West, Michael Crawford, John North, Avril, um, um, John Cameron, is it? Um, forget him. Cameron, anyway. Um, uh, they all studied Latin and Greek from the age of about five. Uh, they learned how to translate in and out of Latin and Greek and to write Greek verse, etc. Um, and they are the last heirs of the effort made by humanists to define themselves against something in the past. And what they were defining themselves against was a different kind of academic curriculum uh, based more on philosophy, based more on problem solving in a way a much um, more hard-edged um, and analytical um, and less deferential to authority type of curriculum, but nevertheless less literary. Um, so the concept of antiquity is the product of these people um, who wanted to mark out their style of intellectual activity as different from one that they wanted to shove out of the university curriculum, which they did with incredible success um, uh, and a, a remarkable degree of ideological neutrality in that uh, by the 17th century, whether you were a Dutch Protestant or um, a Bavarian Jesuit, um, you were teaching pretty much the same school curriculum, studying the same text. And this went on up until the time when, in the Second World War, Patrick Lee Fermer could, um, when he captured a German general, could start quoting Horace, and the German general could finish the quotation for him. So, you know, this was a, a, a big event in cultural history, and out of it came the notion of antiquity, because antiquity was what they were recovering. Up until that point, nobody had known that there was an antiquity. In the Middle Ages, people had no idea that there was antiquity. Uh, um, as far as they were concerned, there was a continuity between them um, and uh, what we call the ancient world. Uh, when the Holy Roman Empire had been revived and then re-revived by German kings, um, every now and again they passed um, constitutions. And those constitutions were added to the corpus, the Justinianic corpus of Roman law, just as if they were Roman emperors, you know, like Trajan or Hadrian. Um, and there was no sense that they were any different. As far as they were concerned, their Roman imperial constitutions were part of a continuum going back to the Roman Empire. Uh, and so a medieval um, corpus juris uh, civilis, uh, in fact, includes these. Um, and they would be taught and lectured on in universities by Roman law professors, um, just in the same way that uh, um, the, what we would consider Roman law was uh, taught and studied. Um, so they, they, they didn't have any sense uh, that they were the Middle Ages and that there was an antiquity. Um, if they did have a sense of a break, it would be uh, with Constantine and with the Christianization of the Roman Empire. And they had a clear sense that uh, that really did make a difference. Um, they were perfectly well aware of the pagan world. Um, uh, they, uh, when Aristotle's um, substantive philosophy was discovered and burst on an astonished world. Um, they knew very well that they were dealing with an alien thought form. Um, they knew very well that, that um, Aristotle believed that the world had always existed, the universe had always existed, um, and they treated that as another. And for them, the gap would be, the, the, the caesura would be, the break would be with Christianization. So, Inside this trio of ancient, medieval, and modern, um, uh, you can see that um, it's, it's not something that appears um, as soon as the ancient world ends. It's something that comes on 
uh, right at the end of a thousand years after what we call the end of the ancient world. Um, and it then this process flows into the quarrel of the ancients and the moderns in which some thinkers said we are better than the people in the ancient world and other people said that the ancient world um, you know, can't be beaten in anything that it did. Um, so by that time, the concept of antiquity is absolutely on um, the map of everybody. Now I think um, um, uh, this is quite relevant to Professor Wang Mingming's paper because this particular process doesn't map at all onto what we find in China, as you so skillfully described. I mean, that was, it was a beautiful paper. I read it with great um, uh, um, intellectual pleasure. Um, and, of course, it does, you do show that there is the notion of an ancient. But there is no equivalent to this notion of the Middle Ages in between. And no equivalent, as far as I can see, you must correct me if I'm wrong, to the creation of the ancient precisely in contradistinction to an intervening period, um, as, as it were, um, uh, uh, an instrument uh, with which to beat a previous academic curriculum. Um, uh, so in this scheme of things, uh, when people in China do talk about ancient and modern, it's ancient and modern, um, rather than ancient, medieval and modern. Uh, now, um, moving on to... ETIC concepts, um, Professor Morris uh, also actually moves pretty seamlessly from ancient to modern. Um, the, uh, there isn't really uh, any space for anything in between in the paper that I read, and again uh, with uh, tremendous pleasure. Uh, the, the ancient world, of course, goes back a long way and it extends right up to, well, the date varies from place to place. But nonetheless, uh, really the understanding is, is that you are ancient until you are modern, uh, or that you move into it. Um, so that's uh, a different analytical framework, uh, but it is an analytical framework that's very different from that emic concept that was developed by the Renaissance humanists. Um, that very unmedieval schema of ancient, medieval, and modern. Well... The very fact that I say that the schema is unmedieval and that I do use the word medieval on a daily basis shows that I do think, in fact, that the notion of the Middle Ages and the medieval does have some point. Um, that is to say, I do think it's a not totally useless etic concept. Um, it's, it's an ideal type um, in the sense that it is one of those words that we use because we have to get to grips with the infinite complexity of the past. This is uh, really what all ideal types are doing as you face this just mass of facts, infinite numbers of happenings. Um, you couldn't even describe what you did and thought in one day yourself. So how are you to get a grip on thousands of years of history? You do this by simplifications and then you move out from simplifications to more accurate representations. So your ideal type is like a sketch map, which you constantly improve on and elaborate. Um, so uh, I guess by the fact that I use the word medieval, I show that I, I don't really uh, think that a, a twofold schema of ancient and modern is adequate for all purposes. Um, and I suppose you can only adopt a schema like that if you focus on really a very materialist conception of history, if you keep things down to um, the, the economy and the ability to fight wars. Once, you, once um, um, Professor Morris got on to religion, um, I thought he began to be on rather shaky ground. I mean, he says... Um, it, I think I quote the phrase in my handout that, um, that bureaucratization and commercialization made the idea of God kings just too implausible. Well, you know, you think of Roman emperors um, in the West, only God kings after their death, and the famous quotation from the Roman emperor when he was dying, oh dear, I'm becoming a god. Um, but... Um, but in the Greek East, of course, the, the emperor is a godlike figure. So uh, the, 
I think the, this sort of schema doesn't work particularly well um, for religion. Um, but quite apart from that, I think it, it, it leaves out too much of what historians, and especially historians of religion and culture, but also actually material historians, consider important. And this is what we call the Middle Ages. So I would defend a periodization which does distinguish the Middle Ages from antiquity. Um, though I wouldn't make too large a claim for it, but it seems to me that it's, it's something worth doing. Actually, I feel almost apologetic about it because what it tells you is too elementary and too obvious. Um, what it enables you to put your finger on is that there is a massive decline in material well-being um, around about the 6th or 7th century. Um, so um, uh, it... More importantly, I think, um, uh, draws your attention to the breakdown of the imperial taxation system. The, the, there is a system of the Roman Empire which you could crudely describe, as those, um, many of you know better than I do, as a system by which you suck taxes out of a very large area, bring them to the center, and use them to pay for work, roads and legionnaires who control that large area. Um, and once that central taxation breaks down, then you have a different kind of world. Uh, people didn't always realize it. Merovingian kings continued to collect taxes um, for quite a long time um, after they were necessary in order to pay legionnaires, and they just used to accumulate them in barns. Um, more and more uh, a bullion would be accumulated in barns because they, they assumed that this is what you did if you were a king. Um, but uh, the system had fundamentally changed by then. So uh, I, 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 you know, I think that is um, a point that is worth marking in our terminology. Um, but it's a very crude one. I mean, you don't need uh, uh, any analytical insight to see that some pretty major things change in the West um, with uh, the barbarian invasions. Um, and you don't, obviously, need to be reminded that it didn't happen in the East. Um, these, are, these are just well-known facts. Nonetheless, they are convenient for purposes of organizing curricula, for organizing syllabuses, when you're discussing replacement of colleagues, etc. You know, you usually have to think in terms of what period you're replacing. Um, uh, and if you are trying to present hundreds of years of history to undergraduates um, and who have to learn it all very fast, you need to have some sort of structures of that kind before you go further. And similarly, at the other end, where you're going to end it all, um, you could say that you should end it um, with humanism. But actually, I wouldn't say that. I mean, the, the, the point at which the humanists create antiquity is not actually a really fundamental change in culture or society. Um, uh, it's a change in the educational curriculum and in the image of history, but not really in the rest of society. Um, all that sort of book art stuff about, um, you know, the spirit of the, the discovery of the individual and the world and man is um, pants mostly, really. I mean, it's, um, there, isn't, there isn't really a, fundamental different, a fundamentally different worldview. There isn't really a new secularism. Um, most of the subjects of Renaissance painting are uh, religious um, uh, for a long time, and uh, Renaissance, Renaissance humanists, um, the presents they give to each other are often presentation copies of Augustine or Ambrose, or the fathers. Um, uh, somebody like Machiavelli with his strident secularism or one or two people in the, the Florentine um, Renaissance um, who are reacting against Christianity um, are really very exceptional. On the whole, this world of humanism just takes on the colouring of the society around it. It's, a new, it's somebody with a new kind of education who gets top administrative jobs, um, and uh, that person will write propaganda for uh, a republic or for um, a, a signore, a dictator, um, or, for, or, or will write Protestant um, works of um, polemic or Catholic works of polemic. Um, it's not in itself a fundamental change. Most other things go on the same. But the real change, of course, is so obvious that, again, you don't need anyone to tell you. It's the Reformation. I mean, the Reformation really does make a massive change to Europe. Um, it um, changes the belief system of, of half of Europe. 
It changes the balance of power between church and state in the other half of Europe. But, you know, this is not a clever thing to say. It's an obvious thing to say. So this sort of periodization, I think, is just a handy way for practical purposes, for elementary courses, etc. Um, but it doesn't have any deep interpretative significance. Now, that is worth saying, because if you go back a hundred years, people really did think that periodization had deep interpretative significance. And it did, this assumption did produce, in fact, some very fine works of history. Although I was a bit scornful of Burkhardt's um, civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, it's still a historical classic. And an even better historical classic is uh, Heusinger's, so I can never pronounce his name, is there anyone Dutch in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Yes. I can always say it when somebody says it to me, um, and then the next time I try and say it, it, it comes out wrong again. Um, his waning of the Middle Ages um, uh, is also within this framework that, that periods have a deep significance, and, the, and what he is saying in the waning of the Middle Ages or the autumn of the Middle Ages is that this represents the end of a period. And there is a whole ideology of history behind this language. And the ideology is the notion that somehow every period has got, as it were, a center, a formula which sums up the structural similarities between art and literature and law um, and, and um, uh, politics. Somehow it all comes together to central, in a central point. Um, and Burkhard with the Renaissance or Heutzinger with the waning of the Middle Ages were describing respectively the beginning of a period or the end of a period, but they thought that period had a unity. And actually, although I, I think it's a mistaken view, it did produce good history because it forced people to make connections between different layers. And that is one of the things that d does produce good history. Is when, when people are, are actually trying to get outside one particular slice of life, and connect it with other slices, you know, as it were, intellectual history with economic history. That usually produces interesting results. So it was a very fruitful error. Nonetheless, it was based on a, on a Hegelian assumption that there is a sort of spirit of the age. Um, and uh, this was beautifully taken apart in uh, Ernst Gombrich's The Task of Cultural History. Uh, I've got a little American edition of this, which has a cover with a picture of a wheel. And the wheel, around the wheel is sort of music, art, literature, customs, law, politics, etc. The, uh, the ends of the spokes, and then there's, in there's the center of the wheel. And this is the Hegelian idea that ages have a sort of center to them. Um, Hegel also thought that peoples had a kind of spirit to them too, and that, it's very difficult to see how those two things are reconciled. Um, but in fact, if you're not a Hegelian, this is a completely gratuitous assumption, um, and uh, deeply implausible, because if you think of almost any age, um, there, there is no one formula to which it can all be reduced. Think of our own period. Um, all right, there are things, there, are, there is one sort of formula, which is a belief in freedom, the individual, democracy, perhaps some level of capitalism, um, human rights. That's one formula. But Islam, Catholicism, um, Buddhism, the, those are just as much part of our time as the, the little package of concepts and ideals that I've mentioned, um, and obviously they all interconnect with each other, but you can't say that any one of them is the essence of our age. Personally, um, I like the idea what, of what I call the, uh, I like what I call the, the, the weak zeitgeist principle, something I proposed long ago and nobody took the slightest bit of notice of it, um, to my astonishment, but I still think it's got something going for it, which is the notion that at any given period, there isn't one zeitgeist, but there may be half a dozen formulae which actually do capture very large parts of life of the time. And those formulae are not reconcilable with each other, necessarily. They can't be brought into any kind of unity. But nonetheless, they are like a zeitgeist in that they do bring together, you know, many different layers of life and you just have to accept that there isn't only one of them, and then the zeitgeist principle becomes quite valuable again. Um, but of course, it ceases really to be a key to periodization, and um, for that reason, I don't think that uh, we should attach too much significance to periodization. Actually, the last bastion of this conception of history, of course, is Marxist history. 
because Marxist history also believes that there is a sort of um, last analysis and that in any, you know, when you're kind of in the middle of a phase of history, you can bring things back in the final analysis to slavery or feudalism or capitalism or whatever it is. Um, and, of, co of course, Marxist history um, can be staggeringly sophisticated and involve huge amounts of attention to ideas and, um, and, uh, and culture. But the, the, the phrase, the last analysis, will be the giveaway that ultimately this all can be explained in terms of a social and economic substructure. Um, and that eventually it will be displaced by changes at the level of social and economic um, substructure. Um, and th this idea extended far beyond Marxism, actually. If you look at historians of the, um, uh, of the 60s, for example, um, somebody like Lawrence Stone um, um, at Princeton, um, I mean, the going, but, but in fact, most historians, the going model of the time would be that there would be a particular social and economic substructure and if the political superstructure didn't keep up with it, then you'd get a revolution. And these were people who, you know, had, had never been a member of the Communist Party or anything like it, but nonetheless they, they went with that kind of model. So, so I think that within Marxism you still have this sort of notion that there is a, um, a central point which gives identity to a period. But then again, one says, why should there be? Why should there be one thing that gives unity to a period? It's just an assumption. There's no... There's no obvious proof of it. You just read it into the past. Um, I, I think the, um, a big problem with that assumption is that it tends to tune out very long-term developments. And I think that the, the key problem with um, taking periodization too seriously, not using it just as a crutch, um, but um, treating it as... Uh, you know, a, a kind of uh, a, a major um, intellectual resource for analysing the past, um, a really good ideal type as opposed to a rather crude and basic ideal type, um, is that it d distracts attention from those things that run right through different periods. And Eleanor was talking about this uh, uh, as one of the things that you tend to get left out precisely, the things that run right through perhaps from um, the you know, antiquity into the Islamic world. Um, and these are things that we, as historians, should be looking at. Uh, which we haven't done enough, I think. I mean, the idea of the long durée um, was absolutely all the rage after the war. But it was really very much focused on um, social and economic history. I mean, it was pioneered by Brodel's great um, book on the Mediterranean, and his interests were really in social and economic history. So he was looking at you know, the patterns of the movement of sheep across Italy or how long it took to cross the Mediterranean over hundreds or thousands of years, um, but not particularly at culture. And um, it seems to me that uh, it's a fairly, seems to me it should be an uncontroversial point, but we need a long durée um, questionnaire about for cultural history also. Um, and um, I... I I don't think this is particularly common. Uh, I mean, it, it, it has existed in the form of the history of unit ideas, if you think of something like Lovejoy's old book on the great chain of being. So people have traced the history of, of certain ideas right through time, and um, they've done that. But um, that's uh, rather remote from social history, generally. And I think that perhaps what we need is a long durée history which brings together intellectual history and social history and cultural history um, so that uh, we can see the, uh, the development as, as it were going down into society um, without simply subsuming it into the social and economic. Um, I think that, uh, that a useful concept for this uh, in fact is the uh, so German sociologist uh, Niklas Luhmann's concept of autopoiesis, self-making. Um, uh, he's he sees society as being made up of, not of, not society not as being a system, but of being made up of an almost infinite number of systems of one sort or another, so that something like the history of ethics could be a system, uh, or you know, ethical inquiry. And he sees these systems as in some sense self-contained. They have a life of their own, but, um, and they do have structures of expectations, but those can change. And 
they're like a conversation that rambles on through time. And I think some, some um, intellectual history could be reformulated in that way. So you're not just studying the history of one idea, but you're studying how, as it were, you, you set the parameters of a conversation and then it continues through time. So I think that would be true of the history of ethics, for example. But what I really want to talk about is the, some of the continuities between antiquity and the Middle Ages. And um, in particular, the religious continuities. Now, I put on your handout um, a brilliant quote from Perry Anderson. as a footnote to his passages from antiquity to feudalism, which I guess is about um, antiquity and the Middle Ages. Um, and I thought it was extremely honest um, footnote, it was in a footnote, not in the main text, in which um, Perry Anderson, who is working, of course, in a Marxist framework, points out that the, nobody has really focused on the way in which Latin Christianity has retained an identity from the ancient world through the Middle Ages into the early modern world, and so on. And this seems to me a really serious object of inquiry, and I think he was on the money in drawing our attention to it. Um, and what we need to do is have a questionnaire that leads us to interesting continuities. So, firstly, this is quite a deep history. Um, for example, um, the, the idea of structuring the week around the Sabbath. Obviously, goes deep back into the Jewish past, as do some of the other things I'm going to talk about. Um, so, um, but, and this, of course, is so much part of life, one doesn't even think about it. But the idea that you build the week around a day of rest um, and add to it layers of significance, namely that the Sunday represents the day of the resurrection. I mean, this is a, a, a very fundamental way of structuring time. And it goes back to some point in the ancient world before the conversion of Constantine, um, and it continues um, right throughout the Middle Ages, um, gets enhanced in Protestant Europe, um, and is still with us today. Um, the structuring of the year, actually, uh, the structuring of, uh, of chronology in terms of the common era, as we now call it, um, I always thought, what an astonishing thing that the, the year 2000 was celebrated magnificently in Beijing. This, this date, which means nothing except in terms of the chronology that is based on the birth of Christ. Um, I mean, this shows how a, a, a way of structuring time has become dominant um, in areas where the belief system that gave rise to it um, uh, um, uh, has no purchase whatsoever. So, again, this is a very deep structure. Um, and uh, similarly, the whole structure of the year around festivals, around Easter and around Christmas, this is a phenomenon of antiquity. It's, uh, I couldn't say when it begins, but by the time I begin to pay attention, which is the 4th century AD. Several millennia before that. Right, okay, but it's, um, uh, um, and of course the meaning of the festivals change. But by, by the 4th century, the, um, the meaning of Easter, and the, I mean the meaning of it, the Christmas of course is a particularly interesting case because um, it takes on the meaning of the birth of Christ and then it's lost it again um, in our own time um, and um, has become the time when you watch Second World War films on television. Um, uh, and which is not entirely sensible. I, I once asked, um, raised this with one of my undergraduate classes and said, have you noticed how they always put on Second World War films? And one of the students very astutely said, yes, because they're all about community sticking together. So actually, um, there, there is a sort of logic running through it. Nonetheless, if you take the idea of Easter and Christmas from late antiquity through to, I don't know, um, uh, um, some point in modernity, for most people, they did actually have significance as representing the resurrection of Christ or the birth of Christ um, with all the concepts that went around that. Um, and so that went beyond just the, the, the fact that you were having a particular time of year. The layers of meaning were a common factor going through time. That's something that breaks right through this antiquity barrier. Um, 
Similarly, the, um, the way of structuring dogma, I think, is very distinctive to Christianity as a religion. Though I, I, this is the kind of thing I say, hoping to get pushback. Because, but the, the, something like what the Council of Nicaea did. Council of Nicaea um, uh, in the 320s, very um, bothered by the question of whether Jesus Christ is absolutely God in the same sense as God the Father, or whether he is just one fractional level below. Um, and all these bishops brought there by the imperial postal service, which was indispensable for an ecumenical council, um, discuss this and bring into play concepts from Greek philosophy in order to try and reach a creed. So creeds are a phenomenon of late antiquity um, when the Roman emperor is still going up and running. It's very difficult to find anything quite like a creed, I think, in other religious systems. Um, uh, something, it's like an obligatory collective belief. Now, you find tremendously elaborate theological religious ideas in all of the major religions. But the, these complicated attempts to resolve paradoxes of the religion in a formula, um, like how can you have um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and get one God, or how can Jesus be God and be man at the same time, the attempt to actually collectively reach a formula which summarizes those things and says from now on this is what everyone has to believe, this is something that is up and running in the ancient world and continues right through. The formula reached by the Nicene Creed, or the Council of Chalcedon, if you can push antiquity a little bit further for the natures of Christ. Fascinatingly, this is absolutely accepted by the Lutherans and the Calvinists. So the Reformation, um, the, these solutions which were so controversial in their day, continue to be common ground between the Catholics and, and their, uh, their, the Protestant reformer opponents. This is a, a Not bad... The orthodox. Pardon? Not the Orthodox. Um, no. Um, uh, well, the Nicene did. Yeah, but there was the, the fifth in 1054 was a part on the question of the nature of God. There wasn't really a split in 1054, actually. The, the real split was in 1204 with the Fourth Crusade. That was, until then, they, they, did, that was, uh, until they, didn't, think, they didn't think of themselves as being um, a, a separate religion. Um, uh, again, um, the, the peculiar nature of the clergy, and this is common to Orthodox and, and um, Catholic religions, this highly structured clergy, this tremendously hierarchical clergy, um, um, it, the best conceptual scheme for understanding it is, uh, I think, Louis Dumont's Homo Hierarchicus uh, w applied to the caste system in India. And obviously, it's totally different in that it's not hereditary in the same way. But the notion of hierarchy, of difference, somehow as being a good thing rather than as being discriminatory. Um, and the many levels of the clergy. This, again, is a huge continuity that runs right through late antiquity, and of course is heavily influenced by Judaism. We had in our department, who was that? Wertzeger, who worked on Babylon. I think she pinpointed the moment when that came into Judaism, that sort of very hierarchical structure. So actually that's a notion of the priesthood, which goes back to Babylon and continues um, century after century in the Middle Ages, out of the Middle Ages and on. Um, the very high degree of condensed symbolism, to borrow Mary Douglas's phrase, um, of the rituals of Christianity in late antiquity, again, and with the Greek Orthodox Church, can continue right through. Um, the um, um, monasticism is a product of late antiquity and um, uh, continues right through. Um, canon law, the collection of canon law texts, the idea that you regulate life by you, that the clergy regulates their life by canon law text. Again, these are the product of late antiquity. The first papal decretal um, uh, is uh, towards the end of the 4th century, Pope Sirisius to Humerius of Tarragona. Nobody then knew that the Roman Empire in the West was going to collapse. Um, so all of these things are continuities that run right through. And it, where these things are concerned, the antiquity, Middle Ages, division 
makes no sense, in my view. Um, so, uh, for that reason, I think perhaps we should treat this sort of periodization as a crutch that we kick away and pay just as much attention as um, uh, Eleanor Robson was saying to those things that one right through. Um, I wanted to add just one last thought about the particular way that we do this sort of global history. And this is more a statement of kind of my personal view of history than something that I can um, sort of declaim with any authority. But I, I'm really not happy with this developmental approach to, um, to world history. This idea that there are stages that every society that goes through. And I realize this is um, in, in um, direct contradiction to uh, uh, Professor Morris's paper, though, though not necessarily. I mean, um, um, and I would strongly advocate in send, instead the, the approach of the mature Max Weber. Now, the mature Max Weber is often thought to have had a developmental notion of history. And he's usually presented as seeing history as leading up to modernization, bureaucratization, and so forth. In fact, I think, and that probably was the problem he began with, but that is not what he was doing at the end of his life. And if you look at his Wirtschaft and Gesellschaft, actually, he's doing something different. He's doing a different kind of global history. What he's doing is global analytical history, global analytical history. And the difference between analytical history is that chronology is not your framework. Your framework is thematic. So he would say, um, take a topic like bureaucracies, and then he would say, there have been five great bureaucracies in world history. And then he would list them, the ancient Near Eastern bureaucracies, the later Roman Empire, um, the medieval church, uh, you know, the patrimonial state. And then from then, he would go on to look at the differences between the bureaucracies. But basically, he was not trying to suggest that there were stages that every society went through. Instead of which, he was trying to provide concepts which structure comparative inquiries about different societies. Now, it seems to me that Professor Morris's approach could well be adjusted to do exactly that. I mean, you know, the idea that it's an ideal type, that unless you have a developed state, you can't have an empire. Well, yeah, I mean, that does make sense. There's no reason, though, to make sure, to make that um, a stage that societies have to pass through. And I think that um, probably the main danger of this sort of ancient, medieval, modern periodization is precisely that it despite the fact that we all gave up the idea of progress generations ago, it's still there, this notion that somehow we are working our way through to a more modern and more progressive future. And I, I think that's something we need to get away from by looking more at continuities and especially by doing our global history analytically and comparatively rather than as a sequence of our gradual ascent towards our own glorious present. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, very eloquent belief for lingerie history and, and many other things besides. Uh, uh, an important challenge uh, to Ian's ideas and to the whole concept of antiquity. Um, again, I, I, I do believe I saw our, our tea arriving in the corner of my eye. But, uh, oh. We, uh, we, uh, we do uh, have time for some questions. So, um, okay. The one time you didn't use was civilization. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, is zeitgeist civilization? Um, I, no, to, to, to me, a zeitgeist is um, an attitude of mind that shows itself in unexpected places in different departments of life. Um, so um, it might be a certain dualism of secular and religious um, overlapping together which might show itself um, in the kind of text that people write, but also in the conception rulers have of their duties. Um, so it, it's anything that, that runs through different levels of life. So, so in fact, if you take sort of Gombrich's the, the wheel with the things around it, um, a zeitgeist could be like that, except you just don't assume there is one per period. He used, he used the word culture. Yeah, he used the word culture. I think he was using it in a fairly broad sense. I mean, I, I must confess, I'm, I'm, I'm not really getting in, I'm including, I'm not thinking of just high culture. I'm thinking of 
continuum of culture and society. And, and I'm, not, I'm not actually really sure about this notion of civilization. I think this was something that somebody in UCL came up with, <laughs> that we should have. <laughs> and somebody, not probably, I mean, I hope, was, was, did the person who came up with this in this room? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry, <laughs> really, I think it was. Um, but um, I, it is contestable, because if you take something like um, the, the work of Evans Pritchard on the newer, for example. Now, this is an illiterate society. By the time he had finished writing about the newer, he said he had learned far more from them than they ever could from him. Um, and, uh, is, and, of course, the newer have long since um, turned into Kalashnikov toting uh, um, marauders. But, in, but at that time, you know, who, who is to say that's not civilization? And, and, of course, if that's civilization, then where is the line between civilization and non-civilization? But, but, so so I, I think it's a, good, it's a good concept to get us talking, but I wouldn't particularly use it as a, as a structuring concept of my own work. Sorry, Murray, I didn't realize that you were defending that. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm not really against it. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if you see any um, useful distinction between the developmental approach, which you criticize, and an approach in terms of one or two transitions. And the classic ones that would come to an economist would be the agrarian uh, revolution and then the industrial revolution, and, and particularly the latter, where you, know, you might characterize the period unifying antiquity and early modern as one in which uh, there might be periods of prosperity yeah. or poverty but you never broke through to exponential growth. Yeah. And in terms of uh, another recent book by Angus Deaton called The Great Escape, where he's looking not just at the achievement of uh, material well-being, but also of, of much greater levels of health and longevity. Again, um, there's a very great distinction between the life expectancy in nearly the whole world today yeah. and what would have been the case in periods before the Industrial Revolution. What was the other the other concept? Is the Industrial Revolution? What was the other revolution? Well, and then I, the, I, I just didn't. Hear I, I mean, I, I suppose Gellner's term, but I think Professor Morris referred yesterday to the agrarian the, um, the agrarian revolution. revolution. Yeah, so you, yeah. you have the move from Faragia yeah, to yeah. agraria. No, I mean, um, I, uh, obviously, I'm I'm not denying the extreme importance of of those changes. Um, again, it's it's kind of a no-brainer that. Both of those things transformed history. Um, and um, I suppose to that extent, you can see a process. So the Industrial Revolution is, I mean, one of them happened so far back in the past that it's before most of what we study. And the other, in a sense, happens in Britain, first of all, and then sweeps the world by conquest and imitation. So it's hard to see it as something that every society would go through. That's to say, we will never know whether, in, you know, if, if industrialization hadn't happened um, in Britain um, or in Europe, whether other countries would have got to it eventually. We'll never know. How can we ever know? So we can't really see this as a sort of stage that's built into human development. Um, so we're left with the agrarian one, which I grant you, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> I, 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 I suppose one follow-on aspect I make, and this is something I think economic historians are more comfortable with the general historians, but the sort of notion of counterfactuals. Yeah. And, you know, it is, I think, meaningful, or at least within economic history, to say that there was a close-run uh, thing with the Industrial Revolution in Sung China, or, and also that if, if it hadn't happened in Britain, it probably would have happened yeah. in the Low Countries or France. Right. And, and, and that's not something that economic historians would rule out of court. They might I, say it's, it's undecidable, but it's still debatable. No, I'm, I'm completely happy with that. I have no problem with counterfactuals um, if they're framed in that kind of way, when you get to the point of showing that something plausibly could have happened. And I can quite see that in those two cases, I could well see, uh, uh, so partly retracting what I said, um, I, I think you could say that the, you know, the, the, the conditions were almost there. Um, I'm very struck, actually, there was a, there's a throwaway line in Weber's um, Wirtschaft Gesellschaft where he points out the significance of a patent law. Um, uh, because if you have a patent law, then people actually can make a profit out of their inventions. Uh, whereas if you don't, then um, they're, they're just entertainment. But I, I'm not denying that. In fact, I, I, I do believe in counterfactuals. I don't know why historians are so against them. I think it's because um, 
um, uh, um, the, the wrong sorts of historians get publicity for um, advocating them. But there's a wonderful book um, uh, uh, by a Cambridge sociologist, Plausible Worlds, Geoffrey Hawthorne. I don't know how many people come across that. Never made a big impact. Absolutely superb. I think a pretty much a knockdown defense of counterfactuals. Um, so I, I, I don't have a problem with that, and I agree. You, you, could, you could easily I, convince me that, say, China was at a point where it probably would have happened if it hadn't been swept aside by um, the West. Okay, I, I think we uh, we could go on, and we will go on, but perhaps later, because uh, the, the tea will be getting cold next door. Yeah. It should be in uh, room 23 uh, next to this. But uh, before we do the big tea, let's thank David. Yeah,